tu akana te na koe. Uh, Kau tau te me tu atahi me whakapāriki tia uh, nga mihi uh, o te wā nei uh, ki te kaupapa uh, ki nga tangata o nei whenua uh, ki a kautau uh, te tangata triti. Uh, kautau uh, nga manuhiri tuārangi, uh, uh, te paipai, uh, ina mate hariatu, hariatu tātou te hongora tēnā rā kautau katoa. Um, wow, what a privilege to be here in this beautiful place and this beautiful day uh, with all of you uh, with a real question, and, uh, and it is. Um, there are so many things that could be referenced and so much that uh, could and should be said and so little time, so there's a challenge. Uh, I've spent um, a lot of time in recent days uh, angsting about today and uh, this very moment uh, and... Uh, uh, but actually thinking about it, I've answered about these questions for probably 30 years and had the privilege of going on part of this country's journey as it's explored bits of its past, some of it uh, not too pretty, uh, some of it very inspiring as we've gone entered into reconciliation uh, process and I think arriving at a very powerful place. Despite my propensity to worry about these things, my conclusion is that uh, we are in a good place, we're doing well, we have momentum, we've got great direction, we are having this conversation and uh, uh, so um, this was a surprise to me that uh, I'm, I'm very bullish about where we're at. I think the, um, it occurred to me that this uh, almost this formulaic script that uh, Māori iwi use to frame uh, an engagement, to get our way into an engagement, uh, offers a lot of hooks uh, for us, a lot of hooks that I see us uh, adopting nationally as our way of doing things. Uh, calling the kaupapa, invoking the reason that we're all here, referencing the flame that has drawn all of us to this place for a common purpose. We know how to do this. The uh, requirement uh, that we, the need that we feel to acknowledge people of place, those who have been the guardians, the protectors, the carriers of story, protectors of environment, so that we might enter that place and and, and enjoy it uh, and the things that might be created on it. That reference to the tangata whenua, that deep respect, is something that I see uh, more and more naturally um, uh, everywhere in uh, in uh, in um, what we do today. Uh, the capacity to connect. So one of the things that Māori orators do, and I'm certainly not one, is draw connections. We stitch one by one this person and that involvement and that association and that thing that we're working on together, and we have the tools to do this. We, we, uh, we uh, have the mechanisms by which we can create common narrative. I think that we're very lucky and blessed and uh, receiving a gift from those of you who come from outside our country here and uh, force us to step up together and be your host. We have to think about uh, not only looking after you and the banaki, that the care for person, but we have to think about signalling to you what we stand for. And if you stay with that idea that uh, when, in Romans, uh, when in Rome do as the Romans do, I think there's a serious question for New Zealanders, for Kiwis, uh, what are our values, what are the things that we stand for, what are the things that we say to outsiders, this is negotiable, that is not negotiable. And I think that's the territory that we need to step into. One thing that... Uh, one thing that um, uh, the, the Māori cultural frame does, and particularly in engagement, is it farewells the dead. It's a very important idea. It acknowledges we, where we come from. We're continuous links of DNA, of whakapapa. We've got backstory and mythology that informs who we are as we are all present here. Uh, we're informed by that, empowered by that, but that is behind us. We, f we acknowledge those things, we cry for those people, and then we let them go, and that leaves us with us. And I think part of our challenge is to own that presence, to own that responsibility. It is our job to mediate between the views and the mythologies and the stories of yesterday and the challenges in front. I'd like us to go more there. I think we are getting to the place where we're comfortably now not a, an outpost, a garden of England. I think we're uh, getting to this the place where we're not just unthinking advocates of uh, the Washington consensus at a time when even Washington isn't. Uh, I'm not sure that we've yet found the courage to say who we are, that poverty in this country is unacceptable, uh, etc., etc. And I, uh, so uh, my hopes are that we remain courageous. I think we're in a good space. We need to maintain the courage to stay present with these questions and grapple with them. I hope that we 
increasingly learn to celebrate all the things that we have going for us and the opportunities in front of us. Uh, and I hope above all else that we maintain our curiosity. What's possible? Where would we like to be? In our wildest dreams, what would that look like? If those things, then who would we speak to? What are the collaborations we'd make? Where would we start? When would we start? I, those questions, to me, put a tune to it. That's the national anthem uh, for which I would stand. Kia ora tato. So without further ado, our next speaker is not Sam. He told me this morning he said enough already and he wants to be last. Um, it is, in fact, Kate Brickberg. Kate has a long history both in the entrepreneurial world uh, and in the philanthropy world, and for very good reason. She's a, a highly respected figure in the New Zealand landscape uh, in, in both those domains. Kate Brickberg. Tēnā koutou katoa ngā huanui o te Aoturo. Tūmai, tūmai, rimotaka, ngā pai maunga. Rere tonu ngā wai o mangaro. Tēnā koe, Matthew, Brian, koutou, ka Joseph. Tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Kate Frickberg, toku ingoa, te tiamana o te ropu, topu tanga tuku aroha o Aotearoa. Nō reira, tēnā koutou katoa. Greetings to all who give to the future. Stand majestically our mountain range Rimotaka. Flow on the rivers of Mangaroa. Greetings and acknowledgement to our hosts and my fellow panellists. And greetings to us all. My name is Kate Frickberg. I'm Chair of Philanthropy New Zealand and I'm a consultant working in the philanthropic and community area. And it's a great privilege and uh, a bit of a challenge to be here today to talk about crafting our national identity. So who are we, you know, these motley crew of us who walk this land? Um, who are we starts with who am I? Where are we going? Well, that starts with where we've come from. So I thought what I'd do is share my own personal search for identity, struggle for identity, um, and relate that to our communal search for identity. And also talk a little bit from a very non-expert's point of view about our history, particularly the treaty, and the relevance of that to our identity going forward. So my surname Frickberg is Swedish. My grandfather immigrated from Sweden to South Africa, where my dad was born. My mum was born in Namibia. They too um, immigrated to South Africa. In 1953, which was the second time the apartheid government was elected, they saw no hope for dem democracy and they immigrated to New Zealand. I was born in Heritonga, Hastings, um, strong nuclear family, but very little connection to extended family or community or the land. And religion was no help either. Um, my mum is a lapsed Catholic. My dad was brought up as a Christian scientist, which he emphatically rejected. For some reason, they christened me Anglican, but I don't know why, because we never went to church. And my husband is Jewish, and so are my children. So if I was a dog at the pound, you know what they call me. <laughs> so, you know, as a young adult, I was pretty lost, really. I didn't know where I belonged. So there I am. I'm age 23, and I'm walking on Tokomaru Bay in East Cape. And my boyfriend had dumped me. I was really miserable. I was saying, who am I? Where do I belong? Do I even belong here? You know, am I allowed here? And there was a moment when it was like a hand stretched out from the earth and a voice said, it's okay, you belong here, this is your land too, and anything you want to do, you can do. And I don't know whether that voice was the wairu or the land or it was just my imagination, <laughs> But I do know it was a defining moment, a moment of gift, of belonging and possibility, and it allowed me to 
fully love this land and strive to be more than I think I can be. Yes, but. Yes, but it's all very well to have mystical voices telling you that you belong here. (laughs) On what real world intellectual contractual basis do those of us who are Pākehā, those of us who are not Māori, those of us who are not the original inhabitants of this land, those of us who are here indirectly because of conquest and colonisation and the confiscation of land, what right do we have to be here? Well, actually we do because of a treaty in 1840, the Treaty of Waitangi. Now, there's lots of debate and I'm not an expert and there's lots of different interpretations, but I think basically you can say that treaty said, let's live in this land as partners. Let's protect Māori values, customs, language, resources, land, and let's ensure participation for all. And it's easy to say, well, that was the government, you know, it's an agreement with the Crown, it's up to them, nothing but me. Well, no, because our right to be here is guaranteed under that treaty, and therefore our responsibility as individuals is for partnership protection and participation. So here's a little example. Next weekend I'm going to Taupo. Well, actually, you're probably not, because there's no such Māori place name as Taupo. There's no owl sound in te reo. It's pronounced Taupo. Well, that's a better approximation, at least. <laughs> you know, and I talk to people who say, yeah, I know it's pronounced Taupo, but, God, it sounds so try-hard. And since when has it been a bad thing to try hard? <laughs> so I think that we fail in our responsibilities under the treaty, protection and partnership, when we don't try and pronounce Māori words correctly. And anyway, it's downright disrespectful. So another thing which gets said is, well, we're multicultural now. You know, this bicultural thing's been superseded. I think that's wrong again, because the term Pākehā can encompass all of us in the land, you know, whether we're European or American or Ethiopian or Chinese or wherever we come from. Um, and all of us who immigrated to this land, I think, need to have a relationship to our cultural heritage of this land, which is Māori. So if we were to visualise what a model of national identity might look like. To me, maybe it looks like a daisy. And at the middle, you have te ao Māori, the Māori world. And around the edge, you have all of these complex Pākehā communities as overlapping petals. And so our identity, maybe, is formed, Matthew, you were talking about it before, at the edges, um, where we overlap, where we intertwine. So, yeah, it's really important. And then what do we do, what, you know, what do we actually practically do as individuals? Well, I think we need to acknowledge the importance of Māori. We need to learn about our history. We need to pronounce things correctly, or try. We need to, you know, stay at Marae, learn a bit of Māori culture and language. And also and this has been mentioned, mentioned before too, we need to share power and share resources in a way that's more fair and ensures participation for all. Personally, I'm really passionate about bridging worlds. So if we, as Pākehā, want to take, make a start and learn a little bit about Te Māori, what is a way of doing it that which is... Uh, works for everybody, which is reciprocal, which is authentic, which is, you know, what what might a 24-hour learning journey, just to start, what are the options, what might that look like? If we wanted to build a bridge across inequality and get rich and poor engaging with each other, what might that look like? What might it look like to authentically explore Pacifica culture, refugee culture from all of those different refugee communities? Um... If anybody's interested in that, then yeah, I'd love to have a conversation with you. 
Final thoughts. I think crafting a national identity is a journey, and it's a bumpy one, and we don't quite know where the road is going. And um, Nikita, you talked about where is she? Um, you talked about you, know, you, you can't see the top, um, but it's really important that we are on that journey because there's a prize, and that prize is social cohesion and prosperity and peace and the innovation that comes at the edge when you get different paradigms, different worldviews, different intelligences joining. So the important thing is that we get started and we journey together. Nō reira, tēnā kota katoa. Got a coat for that gentle and yet very challenging Corin. The gentleman on my left I met half an hour ago. He is the senior curator for Pacifica at the Papa, our most revered national institution in many ways. However, Sean Mallon tells me he is far Samoan and Irish, and he can neither sing nor dance. So I'm really interested to hear from this man, Sean Mellon. <laughs> Talofalava, kia ora, aloha. Um, it's great to be here and to uh, talk to you over the next five minutes about a few things that um, relate to these issues of identity and who we are in this archipelago, this folk this archipelago of volcanic islands in the Pacific. It's something we don't really think about much, I, I suspect. But in a place like Te Papa, where I work as a curator or as a facilitator of stories, in my career, um, Te Papa has been the catalyst for exploring what it means to be a New Zealander and disrupting some of the received histories we get about who we are and where we are in the world. And in the National Museum, you're always trying to unpick the national story. It's about identity. If I was representing Pacific peoples in a museum in Europe, in a museum of folk culture or a museum of Volkakunda, I'd tell a very different story and be concerned of very different matters and ideas. But in a, in a National Museum, part of the, the project for me as a, as a professional curator was figuring out how do we move the Pacific from something that is exotic to something that is more about here? How do we reposition New Zealand as a Pacific place? Because for you know, decades, what justified our position in the National Museum was that we were exotic, that we were these natives that lived over there in these islands. But our history, the, the, but the history of Pacific peoples is very intimately connected with the history of this country. The first people who discovered New Zealand were from the Pacific. They were the ancestors of Māori. Pacific people have been coming for, to New Zealand for over a thousand years. The received history you get in schools, generally, well, at least in my generation, was Pacific people only started coming here after the Second World War. Why did they come here? To do the jobs that most New Zealanders wouldn't do. And they're still doing it today. But Pacific Islanders have been coming here for a thousand years. In the 19th century, they came on ships as whalers and uh, traders. They supported the economic activities of this region um, right throughout the 1800s. In the 20th century, they fought for New Zealand. When New Zealand couldn't get any more men from certain con you know, uh, constituencies, they went to the Pacific and recruited. New Zealanders needed Pacific people to shore up their defences in some of the campaigns that we've heard about this morning in your poem, for example. In the Second World War, they did the same. They fought in the Māori Battalion. They fought in other New Zealand companies. And they helped after the Second World War to rebuild New Zealand, to help establish light industry, get our suburbs growing, get businesses thriving. And today they do some amazing things on the sports field, in politics, in education, in science, but they still clean our toilets, 
work in the orchards. We're still bringing in people on volunteer schemes to work um, and pick apples and fruit because Kiwis won't do that work for the kind of pay you get. So what would it mean if we all New Zealanders were Pacific Islanders? How would we think about our history? When we tackled this exhibition at, at Te Papa about this topic, I joked with the marketing team, what if we talked about the first, New, New, first person to climb Mount Everest as a Pacific Islander? You made more noise than they did. <laughs> it's an uncomfortable thought. thought. What if we, we, we trumpeted Peter Jackson as the, the first Pacific Islander to win X amount of Academy Awards? How would you feel about that? How would he feel about that? You know, we still rely on Islanders so much for our, our history, and there are mutual but uneven dependencies. This wonderful farm that we're on, the hillsides of New Zealand, all that greenery, a lot of it was fertilised by product, fertiliser made from atolls in the Pacific Islands. You know, New Zealand's wealth is so tied up with places like Ocean Island and Banaba. We've, we've benefited wonderfully from that. And I guess, just looking at my time, we're at 22 seconds, if we are to be a Pacific Island place, and if we are to be good leaders in this region, good neighbours, and good brothers and sisters, good kin, as one scholar has said, how does that impact the way we respond to global warming, the people in Tuvalu, the possible displacement and movement of people? How does, that, how do, does it affect how we lead on issues like West Papua? And what is the role of a museum in telling these stories, raising awareness, and getting us to think about who we are and what our future might look like? I think that if we, the reason why I am so committed to this cause in the museum and telling these stories is because I think if we recognize the history of connection to the Pacific, if we see the ocean, as one scholar has said, not as a a body of water that separates us, but rather one that connects us, we can start creating space for connections with other people who are coming to New Zealand. More refugees, people from Asia, people from Syria, Iraq. If we can think about our own ways in which we are diverse and have a history of diversity and connection, then we can create space for that to continue to happen in um, very safe and mean, well, safe and provocative, but also meaningful ways. So um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Kia ora, Sean. I, th I think uh, Sir Edmund Hillary would be delighted were he to be perceived as a Pacific leader, as the first to climb Everest. On a more serious note, from the Hillary Institute's point of view, one of our global laureates is the president of Kiribati, Anoti Tong. As many of you will know, he's facing the reality of his entire nation state, 4,000 years of whakapapa up in the North Pacific coming to an end, regardless of the success that we irrefutably had in Paris before Christmas. It is almost certain that within the next 20 years, his entire nation state will be unlivable. He is Tuakana Tena Viv, he's cousin, he's cousin. Are we going to take 103,000 I Kiribati, here in New Zealand. Our final speaker today is this remarkable young man you've already heard from. I first met Sam shortly after being bounced off the walls of our illustrious offices in Christchurch five years ago today, finding myself unconscious on the floor. A couple of days later, I had a call from an old friend of mine who was the Chancellor of the University of Canterbury. He was 74. His street, there was nobody left but he and his wife. He couldn't get down his drive. He picked up the phone to this thing called the Student Army. And strangely enough, a few hours later, half a dozen students arrived in a van. They didn't know who Robin was. They didn't know he was the chancellor of their university. They came and they enabled him access down his drive. Robin's wife came out and offered them a cup of tea. They said, no, no, we've got that sorted. Thanks, we brought our own, we've got it out in the van. We'll come and make you a cup of tea. 
Sam this morning very eloquently spoke about his own journey. I'm going to invite him now to take it deeper. Sam. Oh, no uh, kia ora tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge the, what the words that have been spoken uh, already, and particularly the notion of um, New Zealand as a Pacific island. Uh, I think we, we are a Pacific island, yet we think of ourselves as this little part of Britain most of the time, which I just find quite strange. Um, uh, just very briefly from me this morning, uh, since I've already spoken, but there's just really three things that I think at the moment um, that are coming up. Uh, one, um, there's this amazing stat by the Foundation of Young Australians last year uh, that... 70% um, of their young people in um, education and training at the moment uh, are at serious risk of disruption um, uh, from automation and technology in the next 10 years. Um, and, and then I look there and then I look at um, uh, uh, stuff.co.nz and I'm like, hmm, uh, where are we talking about these, these issues? Um, and Viv very uh, rightly said this morning, she just reframed the question on, um, re on the refugee question that we're discussing in New Zealand. Um, and for me, uh, a lot of my journey in the last couple of years uh, has just been about asking, learning to ask the right questions. And um, I think it's deeply alarming, actually, that in New Zealand, um, that one project that actually only ran for two and a half, three weeks, the student army, one project uh, and me have become so famous out of that when there are thousands of young people around the country doing amazing things, yet we don't really... I, I get a lot of support. Yeah, we've got a whole lot of people who we, we could support in different ways, and we really could do that in a different way, yet I, I'm just worried we're not. And I'm curious how we do that better. And I think that's the, the whole notion for me in that is around permission that we give to people to create their own whatever it is, and the sense of confidence that we give them as well. So we're on a great journey. I think we're doing well. Um, We've got a long way to go, I think. And for me, it does come down around the questioning that we ask, the permission that we give, and this whole notion of shared responsibility, particularly to children and young people. Right? How do we just share them responsibility, let them come up with their own ideas and their own sort of space and forum? And, uh, and, and, and what's the way that we can do that better on a larger scale? Um, and then the thing around confidence. How do we really give people a lot more confidence to speak their mind? And... and be a bit more argumentative as well. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, I used to. I really was very passive and didn't really question anything. I was, I was scared of challenging anyone in authority. Um, but the, the sort of journey's gone on, and I'm just like, oh, what are we, why, why are we doing this? Why, why are we doing this? And what's the way we change the narrative? I'm not sure how we do that, but um, that was my reflection on um, if we're going to get to the future uh, and really be a leader in the space. Um, Globally, you know, how do we better get there quicker whilst looking back and learning from our past? Um, but big thing for me is around young people in New Zealand. How do we, how do we better work with them? Uh, just not actually work with them, just give them, the, give them the tools, give them the power, give them the permission, give them the confidence, give them a kick, off you go, have a go, see how you go.